Hey guys, Nate and Tommy here, Bare Knuckle Recovery. Um, today, you know, we were going to talk about hitting a wall. Um, some of you say, what, what does that mean, hitting a wall? Well, we're talking about hitting a wall in recovery um, and in the process of recovery because we've talked about before, recovery is a continuous process. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a point um, that you get to and you arrive to and that, you know, it, it never stops, right? Like we're always working on ourselves, always moving forward. So what happens is many times, you know, people get sober and you say, well, why are you talking about this? Well, we're talking about this because we see it a lot firsthand. Um, you know, Tommy and I both work at treatment centers. Uh, we work with a lot of people who also don't go to the treatment centers that we work at, but ask us to, you know, sponsor them, be sober support, whatever it may be. Um, and we see a reoccurring theme pretty constantly with people who kind of turn, you know, sobriety, um, relapse, treatment, whatever it may be, detox, it kind of becomes like a revolving door in a vicious cycle. And, you know, part of that is because, you know, so people get into early recovery and most of the time it's because we come in because we've got like back problems, you know, is what we like to say, you know, get these people off my back. We've got some consequences. There's usually a reason why we go to treatment, right? Uh, something in our life is not going well and we have enough pain to the point where uh, the high we're getting from our drugs, alcohol, whatever it may be, is no longer, um, it's no longer better than the pain, right? So we go to treatment, we, or whatever we do, we, we detox, we get off drugs, alcohol, whatever it is, and we get into early recovery. And the first part is usually pretty tough, you know, recovery is not easy, but there's often in the beginning what everybody refers to as a pink cloud. And in that phase, basically is you know you're sober everybody's happy for you uh sobriety is new and exciting you know you're, you're feeling all these emotions again uh you're dreaming again that's one thing like a lot of people who don't have substance use disorder and haven't used drugs and alcohol don't know is like for me when i was using heroin and drinking all the time like i didn't dream at night <laughs> so like when i sobered up i started to have dreams again which is really weird i don't know if everybody experiences that but a lot of people do so, you know, you're having dreams again, um, and, and, and the world just seems like it's wide open with possibilities, you know? And like I said, everybody's happy for you. Your family's happy. They're like, oh, we're so proud of you, Nate. We're so proud of you. Uh, you can do anything you want to do. We're just glad that you're sober, you know? And that usually lasts for anywhere from like 30 to 90 days, you know? And then people kind of get past that initial phase, you know, the honeymoon phase, the pink cloud, whatever you want to call it. And reality kind of starts to set in. And when reality starts to set in, you know, it, it, it can be very difficult. And a lot of that has to do with people becoming stagnant, you know, like in the beginning, uh, you know, people get a lot of help, a lot of push. There's a lot of uh, structure early on. And some of the things are kind of uh, done for them, you know, because a lot of things in the beginning, you know, we can't do it for ourselves. So then people get to this intermediate point in recovery and then the pink cloud wears off and we hit what we call a wall, right? And we sometimes even before that, we become complacent, you know, whereas we've talked about before, recovery is a process where you're always trying to improve. So you're improving and you're finding new character defects and things you need to work on. Um, so like I said, people, they don't, they stop doing that and they start kind of resting on their laurels, if you would, you know, and they get away from the things that are sometimes making them successful in recovery. You know, like we give people a lot of suggestions, you know, Tommy and I are both in recovery ourselves. We've been where they're at and a lot of the people around them typically that we deal with uh, are also, you know, in recovery and have been where these people are at. So there's usually a lot of suggestions that they're being given and what we see a lot of people doing is saying, well, you know, I've got this far, I've got 30, 60, 90 days and all that all sounds good, but I've gotten myself this far and they forget very quickly how bad things were before they came in and they start to come up with their own plans again. Um, and that is really why it's important that you take the suggestions that are given. And it really brings us to, you know, the point that Tommy's going to talk about where, you know, it's very important that you build meaningful relationships in recovery. Right, Tommy? Yes. I mean, <clears throat> that's one of the things that, you know, I definitely struggled with and that most people struggle with in active addiction is building meaningful relationships and, you know, having good, solid friendships and having, you know, positive relationships with your family and 
I mean, I, I know I never really had any positive relationships with my family and, you know, my friends that I grew up with who were, you know, that were, that were really good people. And, you know, they're the ones that were, you know, making good decisions and doing the right thing and leading successful lives. Like, obviously, a lot of them didn't want to be around me when I was, you know, in active addiction. And I didn't really want to be around them either because it made me feel bad about what I was doing, rightfully so. And, you know, I had a lot of jealousy and resentment towards them. But, you know, once you get sober and you start to get, so, you know, this kind of goes hand in hand with the complacency. Like when, when I would start to get a job, you know, I get a job and I get a little bit of trust for my family back and start getting some money, get a car and, you know, things started going right for me. It's easy for, you know, someone who suffers from this disease to, you know, your disease talks to you in your own voice and it'll start to tell you things like, oh, you know, you don't need to go to those meetings anymore. You don't need to call your sponsor anymore. You don't need to continue doing all of those things that help you get to that point in the first place. Um, that was definitely something that led me back um, into active addiction over and over and over again. It was easy for me to convince myself that I didn't need to do those things anymore. And one of the things that helped me reinforce that was, I, you know, it didn't matter if I had been sober for one or two or three or six months, I still wasn't making the greatest decisions and I still wasn't surrounding myself with people that had my best interest in mind, you know, I was, I surround, you know, we're, it's easy for us to surround ourselves with like-minded people. And if I'm still, you know, living like I'm using, even though I'm not using, it's really tough for me to, well, I mean, it's going to be impossible for me to stay sober. So, you know, this, this last time I started hanging out with, you know, the people that were continuously going to meetings and they would encourage me to go to meetings and people that had sponsors and would encourage me to get a sponsor and, you know, just people that were making good life decisions. And that's something that I had never done before. Um, I started, you know, I didn't live with my family when I got sober. And so I had to work pretty hard to, you know, build those relationships back up. I lived in Indianapolis and my family lived up in Warsaw. So I get to go see them every once in a while. And I wasn't around them, you know, every single day, like I had been in the past when I had gotten sober. And so I didn't really get used to being around them and get more comfortable with at that time and that was a big thing for me like I had to stay out of my comfort zone and that was one of those things that it just encouraged me to you know continue working on building those relationships and getting some trust back and it took a lot longer this last time which I think was a good thing for me because like I said in the past when I get all these things back quickly it always ended up you know I ended up messing it up sooner or later one way or another so you know that's it's a very important part of recovery for me was building those you know positive relationships you know hanging out with like-minded people you know hang out with the winners that's what we were told in you know elementary school and middle school and right. high school you know hang out with the winners and you know back then I thought that was silly but now it definitely makes sense and it applies to life even at almost 30 years old yeah I mean you have to stick with like-minded people um, you know if you hang around five other people who aren't progressing in life you're going to be the sixth person that isn't progressing in life it's true with your recovery you know just like if you're hanging out with people who are drinking all the time you're probably going to pick up a drink um you really just have to be around people who are trying to do the same thing that you are and a lot of times you need people who um have been where you're at and they've made it out and it's just it's one of those things that keeps us from being stagnant, you know? Um, you know, that's why we're so har we harp on people so hard. Like, Tommy and I are both 12-steppers, you know? Like, a lot of people get sober, and they just want to follow their own program. But the reason we tell people to go to 12-step meetings like AA and NA um, is because we see it work, and it's got structure. A lot of us can't think for ourselves in the beginning. We need to bounce our ideas off other people. Um, I certainly did. A lot of my ideas were very terrible ideas, even when I was sober for the first year. Um, and going to 12-step meetings, you know, you learn about principles. You learn about um, your character defects, which is the things that keep us sick. Um, because, you know, for me and for most people that suffer from substance use disorder, the substance is not the problem. There's an underlying issue that causes me to use substances addictively. People who don't have some of these underlying issues that you know they, they can have a beer and not think about I need 10 more um, like there's a reason why I felt the need to be inebriated 24 um, 7 and if we become complacent and stop working on those underlying conditions and we don't have people around us calling us on our BS then we're gonna fall back into old patterns and that's just that's what we see constantly 
I'm not, I'm not going to get a sponsor and I'm not going to go to meetings because going to the gym is going to be my program. Well, I've never seen the gym keep anybody sober. I'm sorry. Um, you know, like the weights, you know, like it's a we program. That's what they say in AA and NA. And it's true. You know, like I am powerless over alcohol, you know, but when I have a group of people together, that's a power greater than myself. And that's why these relationships are so vitally important is because we need people, groups of people to hold us accountable. And I know we sound like a broken record, but we just get tired of seeing people fall back into these patterns over and over again. Um, and part of the reason we harp so hard on it is because it seems like it's harder for people each time they relapse to come in and be humble and to be open to suggestions, you know, because I think they feel beat down, they get shame, they get guilt. Like I was talking to somebody the other day and I told them, you, you know, he, he told his family that he's been struggling. He's been using some drugs and he came clean and he's like, well, I came clean to my family. I think I'm all right. I said, yeah, that's great. I said, but you need support. You know, if you're going to go from using drugs and alcohol every single day, even if you take a 30, 90, 60 day break, whatever the hell it is, that's a complete lifestyle change. You just putting down every substance and thinking you're never going to run into another substance user in your life and ever be tempted is it's asinine. It's not true. Um, so it's very important that you surround yourself with these people, you know? Um, Tommy, you got anything else? I don't think so. Yeah. So take the suggestions, you know, surround yourself with people, the people who aren't, you know, like it's not a game anymore. Fentanyl's out there. It's killing people right and left. Um, I don't want to see people be discouraged. And there's nothing worse than coming clean to your family and your friends and having to do so repeatedly over and over again and keep saying this, this time's the time. So do it once do it right i know a lot of people say there's many ways to uh the top of the mountain and that's true but there are some pretty good formulas that we found that work pretty well so find like-minded people get support make sure you're moving forward so you don't get stagnant and fall back into old behaviors and as always if you guys got questions comments concerns hit us up we're here to help see you guys